Whenever weight loss is in the news, it inevitably revolves around the idea that it's impossible to do. And even if it is possible, then it's at least impossible to maintain. And that's a really popular story because most of us are fat. And by most of us, I mean most of all humans. And by fat, I mean overweight or obese. And most of us don't want to be fat for one reason or another, and most of us have a hard time getting not fat. Even if we know that all you have to do is eat less and move more, it's really hard to do. And so it's a comforting story to think that maybe it's not all our fault. In fact, I've been fat before, and a few years ago, I actually lost 20% of my body weight. According to most stories in the media, including a big news story in the New York Times, I am either an incredible outlier or a future failure who at any moment might balloon up Violet Beauregard style. In the study profiled in the New York Times, researchers followed contestants on the show The Biggest Loser for six years after their finale. And they found that all of them regained weight and did great damage to their metabolism in the process. For instance, Sean Algier originally weighed 444 pounds. He got down to 289 on The Biggest Loser, and six years later, he weighs 450 pounds. He, according to the researchers, now burns 458 fewer calories a day than would be expected for a man his size, which makes his weight loss now even harder. That's a scary finding, which probably had a lot of New York Times readers giving up on counting calories at all and just accepting themselves at whatever weight they happen to be at. But is it a finding that is true? And if it is true, is it applicable to most people who are trying to lose weight? Well, if you've watched any of my videos before, you can probably guess that the answers are no and no. I do think the study is very interesting, but I also think there are some pretty big problems with it. For instance, the same problem I have with pretty much all of these studies that are reporting incredible results. The sample size is way too small. This one looked at 14 contestants. 14 data points is not enough to get a spotlight in the New York Times, at least until it's been replicated. And these 14 data points aren't coming from average people who are losing weight. These are extraordinary people who have undergone extraordinary things. They have lost dangerous amounts of weight under the guidance of trainers and doctors who supposedly had them do extremely dangerous things. A lot of contestants have reported taking drugs like Fenfen in order to limit their appetite and lose weight faster. A lot of them report regularly vomiting and subsisting on extremely low calories while working out all day long. This is not in any way comparable to an average person losing a safe amount of weight, say a couple of pounds a week. It's not just that their results aren't typical. This would be like studying an astronaut who spent a year in space to determine what happens to your body when you go on a loop-de-loop -loop roller coaster once a summer. Also, the people profiled in the study and in the New York Times haven't failed to keep the weight off. One person failed by essentially going back to his original weight, but the others all managed to keep off a significant portion of weight. Yes, they did gain back some fat, of course they did, because they're no longer under intense scrutiny by trainers and physicians. They're no, they're no longer taking weight loss drugs. They're no longer vomiting after every meal, I hope. They're no longer devoting their entire day to working out. They weren't given the tools they need to continue to maintain their weight after they left the show. For instance, Danny Cahill is profiled in the New York Times and presented as a loser, basically someone who failed, but he has maintained a weight loss of 130 pounds. That's how much weight he has lost. That's an entire person. That's a success. Finally, there's a serious problem with how the researchers calculated the number of calories these contestants are burning compared to other people of their size. They can't just compare their metabolisms to the 
average population because we don't have those kinds of numbers. So instead, they had to use an algorithm based on their 16 data points. They used a linear algorithm, which is the simplest one. And depending upon which algorithm you choose, you can get drastically different results, including results that are much more in line with previous research, showing that the contestants did do some damage to their metabolism, but nowhere near what the researchers are suggesting. Does that mean they chose the wrong algorithm? Absolutely not. But it means that we need to be very skeptical of these results until it can be replicated using all of the same procedures, but with more data points. Then we can see how accurate that algorithm was. And even then, we still only have data on what extreme unhealthy weight loss does to extremely obese people. We still wouldn't have anything that we can necessarily say applies to people like me, who were a bit overweight and lost enough to get back to a healthy weight. The moral of the story is that if you want to lose weight, you still just have to slowly and safely eat a little less and move a little more. And don't believe everything you see on reality television or everything you read about reality television.